Namaskar and welcome once again to this course on Introduction to Accounting and Finance for Civil Engineers. And in this lecture, we will be talking of some issues relating to depreciation of construction equipment. In the previous lectures in this course, we have been discussing concepts relating to economic decision making, which is very, very important as far as construction projects and their management is concerned. In our discussion today, we will focus on different aspects relating to depreciation of equipment. But before we go into this, we should understand what is the importance of procurement of equipment, the fact that they have a finite service life and so on. Some of these concepts we had alluded to and talked in some detail when we were talking about the general issues relating to construction projects in the outset of this course. Now coming to introducing this topic, we understand that mechanization and the use of heavy construction equipment is an important part of modern infrastructure projects. When we see any of these infrastructure projects, whether it is a flyover or a metro construction going on, we find a lot of equipment at site. Of course, we must also remember that it is not only the equipment at site which is used, but there are equipment which are not easily seen at sites. They are also part of the mechanical equipments and so on which are important as far as construction industry is concerned. Now the effect on productivity and total cost incurred could be a governing factor in selecting equipment and also we should remember that construction equipment is a very costly item and companies need to make a careful decision when it comes to procuring a construction equipment. Also there could be options in different equipment. And that is what we have been talking about in the previous lectures as to how we evaluate different options. Now moving forward from here, let us look at this table of typical construction equipment which is used at site and we can see that depending on the kind of activity which is involved, there are different equipments which are used. Now I am not getting into the details of this aspect here, but as a home assignment to you, I would expect, I would like that some of you at least should try to understand some of these equipments a little better. Understand it from the point of view of who are the makers or manufacturers of these equipment. What are the kind of specifications that we deal with when we talk of construction equipment? For example, if it is a crane, what are the kind of different cranes? What is their cost? which are the manufacturers of these equipment in India. So once you get into this kind of a literature search, you will be able to understand the importance of construction equipment and the construction industry, the role that construction equipment play in the construction industry and so on. So moving forward, as far as construction equipment is very expensive and calls for what is called capital investment. And that is what has to be made by the companies when they procure these equipments. We will talk about assets and liabilities later on in this course, but we should remember that given the fact that these are extremely costly items, basically these construction equipments are assets as far as the companies are concerned. And different resources are used to procure these assets. And as far as the companies are concerned, we will talk about it later again, there is a book value. They have to show the distribution of their assets, the total assets, in what form they are being held, bank guarantees, for term deposits, equipment and so on and so forth. So these equipment also constitute one of the forms of assets as far as construction companies is concerned. And today's discussion in fact is largely focused on how the asset value or how the value of this asset changes over a period of time. The productivity and the total cost incurred are two of the governing factors in selecting an equipment. Construction equipment are not sold in large numbers and it may be used at multiple sites during its service life. So these are some of the things which we have talked about earlier as well. I am not going to spend too much time on it. Let us try to come to some important definitions formally. Service life. It is the period of use of the equipment in operation. In other words, the period elapsed between the event of purchase and the event of scrapping. 
So, purchase and scrapping are well defined events as far as their occurrence and the time axis is concerned. There is a specific time when the equipment has been purchased or it has come into operation. There may be a small difference between the two, but let us ignore that. There is a specific time when it becomes operational and there is a time when it has to be scrapped. It can no longer be used and this difference in the time is the service life of this equipment. We should remember that there is an accounting definition and there is an operational definition. So, when we take a service life, in this case as far as the discussion today is concerned, we will talk about the accounting definition. That is, we will talk about that period beyond which the equipment can be considered to be as good as scrap. It has already reached its salvage value as we will define. That does not mean of course, that the equipment needs to be physically scrapped. The equipment can continue to be used even beyond its accounting service life. Initial cost, that is the capital investment required to own the equipment which includes the purchase cost, sales tax, transportation cost involved in bringing the equipment to the company storage yard, cost of assembly and installation and so on. So, that basically is the initial cost of the equipment. Continuing further, there is something called a salvage value and it is the value of the asset at the end of its useful service life. Once again here we are referring to the accounting service life and it normally does not include the cost of dismantling and removal, but that is something which can always be incorporated once you want to do that. Then there is maintenance cost which means cost incurred in repair and maintenance operations including cost of replacement of parts, labor charges and any other cost incurred during the operation of that equipment. Let me caution you on a couple of points. An asset can continue to be used beyond its accounting service life that already I have mentioned. Maintenance cost may vary with time and generally increases as the equipment becomes older and consumables, repair, breakdown costs are all part of the maintenance cost. Depreciation is another term which we use, in fact that is the title of our discussion today. That is the gradual decrease in value of an asset due to wear and tear, decay and obsolescence over its service life. This picture here represents how the value of the asset, whether it is in thousand or lakhs, it really does not matter, how it changes from the initial value which is plotted here to a final value which is what we are calling as the salvage value. And this period here is really the accounting service life. So, the point basically for our discussion today is given initial value, given a salvage value, what is the route that it takes from that point A to this point B. Whether it is linear, if it is not linear, what are the other methods available to us? It is not a matter of what methods we can invent. There are some standard methods which are used as far as the industry is concerned and that is what we will seek to introduce to you. As the value changes from the initial value to the salvage value, the change that occurs over a period of one year, this is what is called the depreciation in the equipment for that particular year. And if we add up this depreciation which is occurring on a year to year basis, we should get obviously the total depreciation that we are talking about. In the case of a linear depreciation obviously, all these individual depreciations annually would be the same. If a company has to replace expensive equipment in a given year, it is not advisable obviously to use all the funds from any single year alone. So, at the end of it we must remember that there is a certain revenue or a receipt which is taking place as far as a construction company is concerned. And whether or not the decision to purchase an equipment should be completely supported by the revenues of a particular year is a very important decision. Given the nature of the construction equipment, it will not be appropriate to just use the funds of one single year for obvious reasons. 
Therefore, it is important that funds are set aside every year during its service life to facilitate replacement. It may be noted that this expense is only technical in nature and the funds are not really transferred out of the system. Thus, we can think in terms of an imaginary pool to collect funds for replacing or buying equipment. Now, replacement of equipment is only one part of the total asset procurement. What we are really saying is that a company may have certain equipments. Now, these equipments may have different service lives and will need to be replaced. Now, as far as the replacement of these assets or existing equipment in the company is concerned, this business of trying to set aside funds while these equipments are being used so that these equipment can be replaced is one part of the story. Another completely different part of the discussion is that apart from these existing equipment, how do we fund an entirely new equipment at some point in time, whether it happens here or whether it happens here, whatever it is. So, now for that and as far as buying new equipment is concerned, there is sometimes the taxation systems and policies which allow or incentivize procurement of new equipment and that is something which we have alluded to in a previous discussion and I do not think we will go into that today. Coming to summarize this discussion that we have had in principle, one way of looking at depreciation could be this is an amount of money set aside every year so that at the end of the service life funds will still be available to replace that equipment. Some of the things that you should remember as far as this summary is concerned, if an equipment is not actually scrapped at the end of the service life or its accounting service life, its continuing performance is essentially a bonus. In the above concept, the idea of inflation or the change in the cost of equipment with time can also be accounted for with an appropriate modification. So, in all the discussion that we will do today, we will essentially stick to the formulation that if an equipment costs P to begin with has a service life of let us say n years, even when we go to replace this equipment, it will still cost p. That is, we are really considering the situation where only a fund of p needs to be arranged at the end of this n years period. And when I say that the inflation is not accounted for, that is what it means, that this p is not really 1.1 times p or whatever it is, which is how inflation can be accounted for. But once we understand the principle that okay, well, so long as we are able to arrange p, we can always arrange 1.1 p or 1.2 p or whatever it is, depending on how we foresee the changes in the cost of the equipment is concerned. Now, let us come to the models which are used as far as depreciation are concerned. The first and the simplest is the straight line method. Then we have what is called the sum of years method, the declining balance method and the sinking fund method. So, these four methods are what we are going to be talking about in the next few slides. As far as the straight line method is concerned, it considers that the cost of the fixed capital is evenly spread over the entire life of the equipment. What it means is that the annual depreciation charge in a year t, which is given as dt, can be expressed as p minus s upon n, where p is the initial cost, s is the estimated salvage value of the equipment after n years. And this means that as far as the book value at year t is concerned, which is given as bt, is nothing but p minus the sum of all the depreciation which has happened till that point in time. Essentially what we are doing is, we are saying that we start at this value which is p, we go to s over n years and the depreciation every year is nothing but p minus s upon n and the book value which starts at this point will be nothing but this value minus all this depreciation which has taken place till that point in time. 
till such time as at the end of n years all this depreciation has already happened and we have come to the salvage value of this equipment. So, that is the most simple form of understanding depreciation, the straight line method. Let us try to complicate the matters a little bit and try to see how the sum of years method works. In this method, most of the depreciation associated with an asset is recognized in the first few years and not at the later stages, meaning thereby that an annual depreciation charge in the year t dt, which is the kind of terminology which we used in the previous slide as well, is given by this formula. This formula will become easier to understand once we see a numerical example. And here also, P is the initial cost, S is the estimated salvage value after n years. One thing we must remember that we start at P and we land up at S. This total depreciation does not change in principle. By and large, this total depreciation has to remain constant and that is something which we must keep at the back of our minds. Whether or not this change is linear, whether it is something like this, whether it goes something like this, whichever way it goes, the total change by and large in principle should remain the same. That is something which we should keep at the back of our mind, but I am going to violate this principle in the next method itself perhaps. But in principle here as far as these two methods are concerned, the total depreciation has to be the same. Now let us come to the double declining balance method, where the depreciation is calculated on the basis of the instantaneous book value and not on the difference between the book value and the salvage value and so on. And the rate of depreciation is taken as 2 by n, where n is the service life of the equipment. And the annual depreciation charge in this case can be expressed as 2 by n times the book value of the asset at the start of that particular year. So, in year t, we take the book value at t minus 1. And the book value at the end of the year can be calculated as the previous book value minus obviously the depreciation which has taken place in that year. Now, let us come to the sinking fund method where a fixed sum is set aside every year and taken to be invested throughout the life of the asset and it attracts interest such that the accumulated amount totals to the original purchase price less its salvage value. So, basically what we are saying is that the amount of funds that are set aside as far as depreciation expenses are concerned, they attract interest for the remaining part of the service life. That is something which will become obvious and more clear when we look at an example. This is something which we had actually done earlier in the equal payment sinking fund deposit factor method, where we said that well, given an F, what should be an annualized A in a manner that over a period of n years, if the rate of interest was I, this A should grow to F. So, this is something which is known to us by this formula that is I divided by 1 plus I to the power of n minus 1. So, if we take a back of the envelope calculation, we take I to be 10 percent and the n to be let us say 3 years. Then this factor alone will turn out to be 0.1 divided by 1.1 to the power of 3 minus 1 which will turn out to be 0.302. So, basically what it means is that if we want a unit f, that is this f was to be 1 and n was 3, the 10 percent was the rate of interest that is applied, then this a should just be 0.302. Effectively what it is meaning is that this 0.302 plus 0.302 plus 0.302 plus all the interest that accumulates in this is what is going to give us this value of 1 at the end of the service life. So, that is the principle of the sinking fund method. Now, let us look at an illustrative example which will probably clarify a few things. Consider an asset with an initial and salvage value of 9 lakhs and 70,000 respectively and a service life of 5 years. 
tabulate the changes in the book value of the asset over time using the four methods that we have done, linear depreciation, sum of digits, double declining balance and sinking fund method assuming an annual compounding rate of 10 percent. So, basically what we are doing is we are starting with 900,000 that is 9 lakhs going to a value of 70,000 and this service life here is 5 years. So, what is being asked is that how do we calculate or what will be the different values of DT for years 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 if we were to use the 4 methods that we have discussed. Not only the DT, but also the book value associated with it and the book value is obviously nothing but the original book value minus the entire depreciation which has happened till that point in time. Now coming to linear depreciation which is the straight line method. If we look at this, we started with 900, we go to 70, what is our k? k is the factor of depreciation. Over a period of 5 years, if 900 is the original value, 70 is the salvage value and we divide this by 5, what we will get is 166 that is 830 here divided by 5 that is what is giving you 166. So, 166 is the constant depreciation which is happening, one fifth is coming from the fact that we have 5 in the denominator and one fifth is the total depreciation any given year. So, if that happens then the book value is 900 minus 166 which is this much, we bring this value here, start with this, subtract this, we come here and so on till at the end of 5 years we come to the salvage value of 70,000. Now let us try to see what happens as far as the sum of years method is concerned. As far as the sum of years method is concerned, how it works is that we add all these here. For this case, we are talking of 5 years of service life, so the sum of years is 15. And as far as the k is concerned, which is the factor of depreciation, it varies from 5, 4, 3, 2 and 1 and the depreciation that is happening in a given year is 5 by 15, that is 5 upon this sum of years of the total depreciation that should happen. And the total depreciation that should happen is 900 minus 70, which is 830. So, this does not change. Now, with this not changing, what will happen is that in the first year itself, we will have a factor of 5 by 15, which is one third. So, we will have one third of the total depreciation, which is 277 happening in the first year itself, which means that the book value at the end of the first year would be 900 minus 277, which is 623. Bring that 623 here, the next year the factor becomes 4 by 15 and the depreciation for that year reduces, the book value goes here, you continue to do this exercise till such time as you get the salvage value to be 70 at the end of year 5. So, if you can see from this, as far as the linear depreciation was concerned, it was 166 throughout. Now, what is happening here is that instead of this 166 throughout, it is 277, 221, 166, 111 and 55. So, basically, the sum of years method is giving you a lot of depreciation in the initial part and very little depreciation as far as the latter part is concerned. There are advantages in bookkeeping as far as this model is concerned and that is something which we will talk about later perhaps in this course. Now, coming to the double decline balance method where we said that the depreciation that happens in a given year is 2 by n times the book value not the salvage value, it is the book value that we are talking about. And in that case, what happens in this particular example is that we start with 900, we have 2 by 5 as the factor. This 5 is coming from the fact that my n is equal to 5 in this particular case. And which means that we are basically operating 40 percent of the initial book value would be the depreciation for that particular year. And if that happens, the depreciation will be 0.4 times 900, which is 360 here, which will give you this book value. Apply this 0.4 on this 540 and get this depreciation. Continue to do this exercise till you land up with 70. Please remember 
that in this case, maybe the examples and the numbers were chosen such that this book value at the end of year 5 is indeed turning out to be the same as the salvage value which was originally estimated. But in this particular method, that is the double declining balance method, since we are actually not considering this 70 or the salvage value in our calculations to begin with, there is a possibility that this salvage value and the book value at the end of the service life may not match. That is something which I am leaving to you to think about it. We will possibly try to do a small example if we can and let us move forward. Now coming to the sinking fund method, here is the example that we have done. What we have is that finally we want 900 minus 70 which is 830. So my F here is 830. I is given to be 10, N is 5 and therefore if I use these numbers I is equal to 10 and N is equal to 5, the factor here will turn out to be 0.1638. Now this is the factor that you can of course, in this particular case, you can probably do it with a calculator, but again, you can always go back to the tables and see this number. Now, once you have this 0 0.1638 and given the fact that 830 is what you need and not a unit value, therefore, what will be the A for 830? It will be 0 0.1638 multiplied by 830, which is 136. So, now this 136 is what is your A. That is, if you set aside all these 136 for a period of 5 years, they will grow to 830. What you are effectively saying is that 136 into 5 plus the interest that you get, this will be 830. So that is something which we need to establish. Now let us try to understand how it really works. So if we keep removing 136, putting it into a pool as I called it, there will be an interest associated with it and these are the interest values. I am leaving it to you to calculate those interest values and you will find that at the rate of 10 percent, since this is the value that you have set aside, it will attract some interest and then again you set aside 136 that will attract some more interest and so on. So, if you do that kind of a calculation, this is the book value. So, what this table really is showing you is that A that is this column is showing you the fixed depreciation that is this value here. And then I indicates the accumulated interest in the year T and as more and more funds keep getting transferred into that pool, you see that the interest is also going up. It is not only going up by 13.6 and 13.6, but a small amount which is higher than 13.6 because the previous 136 is also attracting interest for the second year and the third year and so on and so forth. So, this is the accumulated interest in the year T and this DT is the effective depreciation in the year T which is nothing but the sum of this plus this. Now, once you do that, then you get to the book value which is the original book value minus the DT and once you do that computation, you can always come up with the final salvage value or we can calculate the book values at different points in time. If you do this and then try to plot the straight line method or the sum of years method or the double decline or the sinking fund methods and try to plot how the book value changes, this is what you will get. What it shows is that depending on the method that you choose, you may get book values which are quite different. The other side of the coin is that you can always create a table which says that okay, if I have year 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, what is the DT which is the depreciation for that particular year using the different methods. That is using the straight line method, using the sum of years method, using the double decline and so on. So, these numbers we have already calculated. For example, for the straight line, all the all across here we had the number of 166. Similarly, you can write these numbers down for the sum of years method or the double decline method and you will see that the amounts of depreciation which is happening in these cases for different years is different and therefore, so will be the 
total amount of depreciation incurred or accounted for at any point in time. And this can be coupled a similar table instead of the depreciation can be calculated for the book value. That is for the different time periods 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, what is the book value using method 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, whatever the methods are. And this is what has been represented to you graphically. So, this is being left to you as an assignment. You try to create that table and understand this picture a little better. Now, coming to a more realistic situation, companies often use the double declining balance method as the rate of depreciation is very high. Sometimes the book value at the end of the useful life may not be equal to the salvage value that was initially assumed. Now, if that happens, there could be situations as far as taxation is concerned and the company may have to pay additional taxes. Now, let me explain this with a small example that if we have an initial value of let us say 1000, salvage value of 0, service life of 5 years, using the double decline method, what we are saying is that since it is 5 years, we are talking of 2 by 5 which is equal to 0.4. So, 0.4 will be the factor that will operate and this will become 400 when we come to this, it will become 240 and so on and so forth. If we do that, finally the book value here is turning out to be 77.8, that is 129.6 minus 51.8 is 77.8. This value is not 0. In fact, one thing we should remember is that if we are using double decline, it will never go to 0. It will always retain a finite value. And now, how do we handle this is something which we will probably have to think. Of course, this results in a situation where the company may have to pay additional taxes as the actual salvage value is higher than the initial assumption. Now, as far as the paradox of having different salvage values at the end of the service life is concerned, that is sometimes resolved using switching between depreciation methods. Now, what that switching means is that at some point in the course of the lifetime of the asset, the method for calculating the depreciation is changed to meet the salvage value which was initially assumed. So, this is a matter of working backwards to some extent and trying to ensure that the salvage value initially assumed is not different from what is actually obtained at the end of the service life. For example, the method is changed from the DDB to the straight line method as the latter has a relatively higher depreciation during the later years of useful life. Effectively, for the entire lifetime, the depreciation is calculated for both methods and the higher one is chosen for a given year. As an illustration, if we do the same example that is start with a 1000 and we want to go to 0 at the end of 5 years, we calculate the depreciation using DDB as the first method and we calculate the depreciation using the straight line method. So, as far as the straight line method is concerned, we will be talking of P minus S upon N, that is something which we had discussed. Now, as far as this particular example is concerned, what we will do is, once we have this 400, the straight line method gives me only 200, because it is 1000 minus 0 upon 5. We use the higher of the two, which is 400 and the book value becomes 600. Now, on this 600, we operate 40 percent and we operate the straight line method. That is, this number is not the same as 200. So, this is only 150 because it is 600 and now the remaining service life is only 4 years. Therefore, 600 divided by 4 gives me 150. Again, we take the maximum of the 2, 240, this becomes our book value. Repeat this exercise, this becomes the book value. But now coming to the fourth year, this gives me only 86.4, whereas this is giving me 108. So, choose this and we get a book value of 108. Again, this value is higher than this here. Use this value and we get the salvage value to be 0. So, this is how we assume that the book value that we get at the end of the service life is not different from the salvage value that we initially assumed. So, as far as this example is concerned, we have switched 
from the d d b to straight line in the fourth year. So, depending on the numbers that are given, the switching could be happening at different points in time. Now, as far as the total equipment depreciation at a particular site is concerned, a construction site does not necessarily use just one equipment, it could use several equipment and then what we have to determine is what is the kind of equipment cost that should be charged as far as that site is concerned. So, what we should be paying at least from that particular project is the total depreciation that happens for all the equipment at that site. Now, if we take an example, if the site uses let us say 3 equipments 1, 2 and 3 which have these initial values, the salvage values and the service lives are given and the age at which these equipments have been made available to this site. Now, this is 3, 10 and 5 and the question is what is the total depreciation due at that site? Carry out the computations using the linear and sum of years method. So, the sum of years method or the linear method is a matter of detail. What we have to really see is how much is the depreciation to be charged at this site. Now, what we notice is that this equipment and this equipment are in the last year of their useful service life. The useful service life is 4 and 6 here and they are already 3 years and 5 years old when they are brought to this site. However, in the case of equipment 2, the useful service life is 9 years and it is already past that. And therefore, as far as depreciation is concerned, we need to calculate as follows. If it was the linear method for equipment 1, for equipment 3, it is 100 minus 0 by 4, 300 minus 60 by 6, we get a total of 65 lakhs. As far as the sum of years method is concerned, this numerator is coming to be 1 because it is in the last year of its service life. Similarly, here also it is 1 because it is in the last year of its service life. Of course, the service life here was 6 years. So, if we do this calculation, we find that the total depreciation due is 21.4 as against 65. Of course, as far as equipment 2 is concerned, its use at this site is basically a bonus because the equipment has already served its service life. Now, so far we have talked about a service life and the depreciation being related only to the service life. Is there any other way that we can count depreciation as far as construction equipment is concerned? Yes, the answer is yes. That can be based on the unit of production method. Unit of production depreciation basically accounts for the fact that an equipment may not be able to work beyond a certain point if it has been used for a certain amount of work. Basically, sometimes accounting for depreciation of an asset is more closely related to its use than time and the method may be used for construction equipment that has very heavy use in some years and very light use during others. In that case, the unit of production depreciation in any given year is basically the production in the given year divided by the total life minus the time capacity the into P minus S, where P is the initial cost and S is the estimated salvage value. This will become clear if we take a simple example. If we talk of an excavator which has an initial cost of 20 lakhs and a useful life ends after excavating 50,000 cubic meters of earthwork, the salvage value at that point is estimated to be 2 lakhs and what are the yearly depreciation expenses of the equipment in a project if the construction schedule calls for 8000 cubic meters of excavation as given below. So, we are talking in terms of excavation which is up to 8000 cubic meters spread over 4 years and the useful life is not in terms of time, but in terms of 50000 cubic meters. Of course, the initial value and the salvage values are given as usual. So, in this kind of a situation, the depreciation cost per unit excavation can be taken as 36 rupees per cubic meter. Now, if that is taken, then we know that for these amounts of excavation for which this equipment is being used, then we can calculate the depreciation in terms of INR for any given year. So, this is just another alternate method of trying to understand depreciation, not only in terms of time, but also in terms of the usage, that is the units for which the 
particular equipment has been used. Now, with this, let me come to a summary of what we have been talking about today. We talked of the concept of depreciation, we talked of the different methods that are used or the models, we talked of switching between the different methods, we talked of how to calculate the total depreciation due at a construction site which uses multiple equipments and we also had a quick look at the unit of production method of depreciation which is slightly different from the other viewpoint which is largely related to time. So, in this method we were trying to talk about the actual use of this equipment. Now, with this we come to a close of our discussion today and this is the list of some of the books that you might find useful and I look forward to seeing you again in a later lecture. Thank you. Thank you.